You know, are we just allowing any kind of sexual expression that we want, or are we putting parameters on it? Every single annual conference I've been to since 1996, it has been uh, talked about. We never decided, and we decided not to decide, and for a long time we decided not to decide, and, and we had a lot of people kind of doing their own thing and making up their own mind. When you don't have standards at all, then what exactly are we trying to recruit people to? We've lost our mission. Hi, I'm Parker. And I'm Tim. And this is The Rage Podcast, where today we are going to talk about something that has happened in some of our personal lives recently. Yeah, close and to home. In, and in the life of our church. So, what is that? Uh, disaffiliating from the United Methodist Church. And uh, I wanted to start it off with uh, Tim's opinion on some of this <laughs> stuff. So, yeah. let's go right into yes. it. Yes. Well, uh, for those of you who uh, haven't heard yet, which is probably none of you, Wayne Street uh, voted to disaffiliate from the United Methodist Church last Sunday. And uh, the vote was 124 to 18, so a pretty overwhelming uh, uh, vote that was taken by the members who were there. And a, a number of other folks have kind of chimed in uh, since then and, and been a part of the conversation. I'll tell you, tell you, for me, it was a heartbreaking day. That's not that I disagree with the decision. I, I'm actually in agreement with it. But, uh, you know, I've got a lot of years, a lot of decades tied up in United Methodist Church, and to now know that I'm not going to do that anymore. Uh, kind, kind of taking a different, my, my life has taken a different uh, track than I ever thought. So uh, I'm very proud to uh, be the pastor of a church, uh, pastor of this church. And uh, we're in conversation as to what that's going to mean going forward. But uh, just appreciate the opportunity that we have to to serve the Lord in whatever capacity is given to us. So yeah, so to give a little bit more detail, uh, as Tim's just giving, Tim, you know, has always been, his life has been a United Methodist. And then he went in for many years to uh, into United Methodist uh, ministry in, the, in mm -hmm. the pastoral role and went through seminary at a United Methodist seminary and, and so forth. So that's his perspective. He has many years under his belt. And so my perspective is, is I was a person that was going uh, right through the early stages of the process of hopefully one day becoming like a Tim. Yeah. And, and, and one thing, I mean, just to make clear, uh, Parker's the pastor at Want Grove, which is already disaffiliated. Yes. Yeah. So I, I wasn't in, in, in some of the, in some of the cases, a little obviously behind Tim, but I was going through the process of becoming a United Methodist yeah. minister as well. I now serve a disaffiliated church, and uh, as of, I mean, like three days ago, I mean, welcome Pastor Tim to the club of non-denominational uh, ministers. Yeah. And um, so, uh, yeah, let's get into some of the things that we kind of uh, recognized as uh, conflicts, and, and some of these are true for Walnut Grove, not all of them, but um, these, this is kind of what laid home here at Wayne Street. I compiled these from my memories of conversations I've had with people over the last, like, three years that we've been talking about this. What I heard from most of the people who were not in favor of disaffiliation is they just didn't want to depart from the United Methodist Church, a position I completely understand. Uh, but but that but that was the main uh, connection, you know, because all of the uh, the the connectional ministries like UMCOR, which is the United Methodist Committee on Relief, they're the ones that go out and respond to disasters. You know, any of those kind of organizations that we want to support, we can still support them. Uh, there's no, no reason why they wouldn't accept our contributions now at all. Uh, just because we're not paying apportionments to, to those things now doesn't mean we can't support them. And we will be supporting a number of those uh, initiatives that are actually making a difference in the world. So but I wanted to say that first. So after all of the disclaimers that we've just provided yeah. you, let's get into point one. The ongoing and never ceasing conflict that is going to uh, affect the UMC from obviously many years prior to this moment, mm -hmm. but also for many years more to come. And Tim, you being a person uh, of, of old, wise age, I want you Careful. to share your uh, context and yeah. what this conflict has looked well, I, like in your life. I, 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 w I began the candidacy process in uh, 1996. And uh, at that point, there was a lot of cons uh, conversation around uh, human sexuality and a lot of what that was going to mean. Uh, when I was ordained in 2004, uh, there was still a lot of conversation Every single annual conference I've been to since 1996, it has been uh, talked about, and uh, the, it just nothing was ever settled. You know, you know, are we just allowing any kind of sexual expression that we want, or are we putting parameters on it? Uh, we never decided, and we decided not to decide. And for a long time, we decided not to decide, and and we had a lot of people kind of doing their own thing and making up their own mind. And again, regardless of which side of the issue you're on, the letter of the text, as far as the discipline goes, it was pretty clear, uh, incompatible with, with uh, Christian teaching. And, uh, you know, whether you agree with that or not, that was the stance. That was the rule. Now, if you want to change the rule, again, that's where the conversation has been. But as of today, even, 
the rule has not changed. So why are we still having this conversation? Uh, and, and I think that's what a lot of people were getting tired of is we'd always go and fight these things out. And, and, and again, it's not about fighting out issues because I think uh, organizations having discussions is extremely healthy. But the problem we'd have with this particular conversation since we've been having it for 50 years is uh, we'd all walk away and we would count victory as we prevented the other side of the issue from attaining what they wanted. That's how we defied victory. That's not victory. That's stalemate. And in all reality, so we have what has happened is you prevented both sides from getting anything they wanted. Therefore, the entire group is yeah, ticked. We're, we're, right. we're, we're frustrated. Right. And I don't read anywhere in the Gospels where we define ourselves by this issue. I, I, I just... I, it, it, it's frustrating that we spent so much time talking about that when there's so many other very valid things that, that we could be talking about that are uplifting and positive. And I just wish we could have expended that amount of energy on those things. And I'm not blaming conference mm -hmm. leadership. I'm blaming everybody for yes. that one because nobody nobody would let it go. Another disclaimer, though. Uh, in 2024, around, uh, in, in what, May? May and June, right? Is when general conference is. The first general conference since... 2016? Yeah, yeah it's 2016. COVID canceled the last yeah. one, yeah. It happens every four yeah. years. So 2024 is when this is um, supposed to happen, and I'm interested. You know, I'm obviously not a United Methodist anymore. Tim, you know, is in the process of yeah. whatever that means. Yeah. And um, I'm interested to see, are they going to make a decision then? Mm -hmm. But the problem is too late, right? I mean, we're, we're far past the, uh, the stance of if you make a decision now, I'm... A lot of you, we've already, we're already out. So, and I know there's a lot of other churches that are in our position. And uh, it's sad that we got to the point of being so irritated with um, the lack of that leadership or the mm -hmm. lack of just making a decision or a statement even um, that we've all ran out of this, uh, what was a beautiful organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's too bad. And, and, uh, and that's, that's, it, it's that ongoing thing. This, like every time we get together, we can't get past this because there's always a resolution about it. There's always something. And, and uh, it just, I, I, I would leave annual conference just defeated and deflated when it, that's not how we should be leaving. Mm -hmm. You know, it, whether I got my way or not, at least there should be a feeling of making progress. And in 20 years on this particular issue, there just, there just wasn't any. And all the while, you know, uh, as anybody who's been a part of a church knows, attendance is going down and membership's going down and giving's going down and, and, and secularism is on a meteoric rise. Those are the kind of things we should have been addressing. And instead, we were stuck on this. And I think what Tim said can bring us almost uh, very clearly into our second point of how he said ongoing conversation. United Methodist, at least in, I, I know Wayne Street, this happened a lot. I don't know if it's the, the um, they're going to be the case for a lot of other churches, but I think being the kind of the scale and, and the community that Wayne Street is in, this was just a natural thing to um, take kind of a view away from a mis the mission and, and, the, uh, and, the, and the stance and of what the church is supposed to be. And this this has affected, again, once you get into those larger larger scenes and arenas, such as a, a conference, we've lost our mission. Yeah, yeah. They've lost their mission. Yeah, we've lost completely the focus on mission. Whereas now today, whenever, whenever the church whether it be the Catholic church or the Protestant church or just the church and whatever, whenever it's portrayed, it's always, you know, we hate gay people. That's how, that's how we're portrayed. I, I don't know that that's accurate. Mm -hmm. You know, we have standards that, that we set, but look, if you don't want to abide by the standards, you know, whatever, I'm just saying those are not the kind of standards we should be endorsing and condoning. What I really think happened here is how politicized everything has become. Yeah. And, and the church and politics has always gone, had their... Uh, ties together in, in a sense. But what I think I really see a lot of what happening is missions and politics don't match at any level. Yeah. Politics only creates division, only creates certain groups and sectors and certain things. Missions, you cannot have that. Mm -hmm. That's not how missions work. Missions, you don't say, well, we're going to give money to, we're going to give money and relief to this group of people. That's not how missions work. You yeah, give, yeah, that's yeah. called mission creep is yes. what that is. Yeah. Where, where, where you're laser focused on one thing and then all of a sudden it's this and now it's this yep. and pretty soon it, yep. it's everything. Yep. It's whatever you want to do. Now we have no standards at all. And that's the slippery slope we were sliding, the Methodist Church so we, we lost missions because the church uh, got far too consumed into the political realm almost of, 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 again, church politics is one thing. And then 
world politics, you know, yeah, in government. Yeah, we should have been above yeah. that. Though that's another thing. But again, we lost mission because we got into the dividing and building of walls that politics can do, I think. This is, you know, this is my opinion here. And because of that, missions and politics just never work together. And, yeah. and we, we lost that whole motive. And in trying to do that, we get to the third point, which is there was no enforcement of any rules or standards. What is the what is the United Methodist stance on human sexuality? I, I couldn't even tell you. Mm -hmm. I can tell you what the discipline says. I feel like this issue is just a symptom. It's not the problem. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, you know we don't want to offend anybody and, and, and we don't want to you know we want to be all accepting and all this stuff. But I, I think the problem is is when when you don't have standards at all, then what exactly are we trying to recruit people to? You know, what are we trying to bring people into? Yes, we're trying to bring them into a relationship with Jesus, but what does that even mean? You know, Jesus, who was uh, uh, very clear on a lot of the standards that he held, uh, wanted to embrace people, but he didn't want to just leave them there. You know, when he encountered people, when he talked to people, he, he invited them to a new life. He did not justify their old life. He did not condone their old life. He didn't go through and say, you know, everything you're doing is fine, and I'm, I'm glad to be a part of this now. He never said that. He offered grace, thank God for that, and he offered forgiveness and mercy. But he didn't, say, he didn't say, but everything is okay. He didn't condone. He, he, he wanted people to live to a higher standard. And we have decided that we didn't want to do that anymore. And for so many issues, we just wanted to excuse. And that's what's got us where we are now. We're just the great excuse givers. And the problem is, is we, have, we have rules, but we also, in several different conferences, we struggle to see if those rules are ever applied. was mm -hmm. a, bi a big thing that where I... I feel like, Tim, you went in a different direction than what I was thinking, which happens okay. oftentimes. But anyways, but uh, no, I, I'm thinking, you know, in, in several different conferences, you know, uh, how I can't even tell you how many conferences. What is there? 45 conferences yeah, in the U.S.? Bunch, I'm not sure, yeah. It's not all 50 states, but there's a, a 40 some conferences, I believe, in the U.S. Maybe 38. That sounds more appropriate. Whatever. But in, in that case, you know, every conference was enforcing the law in a different format. And that's, that's not how it's supposed to be. Or, you know, they're going to overlook a certain right. part of the law. Which has led to the confusion we were just talking about. So what is the United Methodist stance? Mm -hmm. Well, it depends on where you are. Yeah. Well, that's not how standards work. Say say we were members of West Ohio Conference, but, you know, say even even in East Ohio, there's some things that are done and yeah. carried out differently. But in, and to understand this is the United Methodist Church is core laws are written out in something called the Book of Discipline. And the Book of Discipline is a universal United Methodist book. It's not it's not based difference upon a conference or anything. That is the if you're a United Methodist, this is the Constitution, the principle. Yeah. Everything is in there. And that book has two purposes. First of all, as Parker just said, it's to help the people who are members to know what you're signing on to. But also it's to help people understand uh, outside of the church to say, okay, here's what they stand for. You know, th th this is what it means to be a part of the group. Because if it means whatever you want it to mean, then you're not a part of the group. See, that's the problem. Uh, and there have to, have to be some standards in there somewhere, and those standards have to be upheld. And um, I, I, just, I just feel like uh, the, the, the edges of our Methodist movement are just getting too blurred. I don't think edges is even the right term anymore because edges still defines a separation. No, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 this, and this is what leads us to the next problem. Number four is uh, whenever you don't have any standards and people can get away with whatever they want to get away with, that leads to a lot of bad press. And there is a lot of bad press about the United Methodist Church out there because our, our vulture media or vampire media, I'm only using that because I can't use the worst word, it, they, they, just, they just gravitate toward any kind of uh, sensation that they can get, especially when it comes to the church. So, so what would happen is, is you have people who would report these outlandish things, and this, this came from the right and from the left, you know, saying something crazy or, 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 you know, here's this one exception and now everything's coming apart or whatever. Well, there was no way to dispute that because there's no standard. If you have a standard, you can go back and say, I know that's not happening. If you have evidence it's happening, now we have repercussions to that. Where when you don't have standards, you can't say that. So these sensational headlines would come out on, again, both sides. And we're absolutely guilty of this. But there was no standard to say, no, we know that's not happening. And if it is, we know how to stop it. You can't. And now everybody's accepting of whatever it is, whether it be some crazy right wing conspiracy. And there are plenty of those out there. You have no way to re refute it. And this is um, what I what I see a lot of happening is the loss of the black and white. Yeah. Again, life is full of gray. Life is full of areas. But when you are running 
an, an institution in, in a church, you know, such as big as the United mm-hmm. Methodist Church, you got to have a pretty firm stance and understanding of what's what you're going to accept and what you're not going to. There's several churches in, in the U.S., uh, especially in around the world, that are open of um, LGBTQ leadership, pastors, clergy, and all those things uh, to be able to serve in the ministry. Mm-hmm. Um, according to the Book of Discipline, as it still is written, the United Methodist Church is not yet, again, as we've mentioned several times already, it wasn't enforced. What you need is a clear separation of, of the black and the white. What mm-hmm. are you? What is the rule and how is it being enforced? And you know, what are you not going to accept and, and why? And give your defense for each reason why. Right. And not having a standard just, just allows you to do whatever whatever you want to do in the day. And that is confusing. And I tell you, the that confusion will destroy an organization faster than anything. Yep. Any, it, any organization. Anything, any organization. Yep. And, uh, and now we got to say, well, what's the standard we're teaching kids? What are the standards we're teaching new members? What standards are we going to go go and say, you know, this this thing, this report is is incorrect you know, and if there's evidence again, we're going to do something about it. Again, you lose all of that when there's confusion. Mm-hmm. Thank you for watching this episode. I'm sure that some of you have heard things you didn't agree with, and that's fine. Uh, but but at the end of the day, we want to go forward stronger, whatever that may mean. And so uh, I guess also, Wayne Street, uh, remember what we're still doing. You know, we're yeah. not over. The missions are all coming back and all these things, and we got to, it's on our own now too. Yeah. And so r- respond to that call with uh, an eagerness to serve and, and so forth. And uh, that's all I got to say. And I think you said it well. Have a good day, everybody.